Hi, listeners. This is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, the show about the world's most pressing problems and how you can use your career to solve them. I'm Rob Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. If you're really familiar with GiveWell, as I know some listeners are, you may well want to skip through the first five to ten minutes of this episode, as it could be covering things you already know. All right, here's James Snowden. Today, I'm speaking with James Snowden. James is a research consultant at GiveWell, and he graduated from Oxford University with a degree in philosophy, politics, and economics in 2011. He then went on to do an MSc in philosophy and economics from the London School of Economics. After that, he spent several years working as a strategy consultant and then as a researcher for the Center for Effective Altruism. So thanks for coming on the podcast, James. It's great to be here, Rob. Uh, GiveWell is actually hiring at the moment. So later on in this interview, we'll get to discussing what it's like working there and what kind of people they're looking for in case uh, some listeners might be able to to fill some of the talent gaps they have. But first off, I I imagine most listeners will have heard of GiveWell, but for those who don't know a lot about it, uh, what does it actually do and what's, what's its history? Uh, Sure. So we're an organization based in uh, San Francisco that tries to identify evidence-backed, cost-effective charities uh, and publish all our research and and reasoning online so that anyone can check our rationale. Um, We focus on international giving opportunities uh, because we think donors can generally have a greater impact in in poorer countries. uh, And we currently recommend nine top charities to which we direct about $100 million a year. Uh, We also run an incubation grants program uh, to support the development of future top charities. And in terms of our history, we, we were founded about 10 years ago by Holden Karnofsky and Ellie Hassenfeld, who were two uh, people who just came out of the hedge fund industry and were trying to find you know, the most effective way to donate their money. Uh, and once they kind of started looking on this online, they, they found that nobody was really providing this advice, so they started to do it themselves. So yeah, I mean, there's a lot more details and nuance that I'm sure we'll get into, but, but that's the kind of broad picture of GiveWell. Yeah, uh, I've already done an interview with uh, with Holden, who was um, one of the founders, uh, where he talks about this for a little bit. And, and I hope to do an interview with Ellie, the, the other founder of GiveWell at some point, and perhaps go more into the history because he's been around from the beginning. But to, to begin with, it was just interested in finding the best giving opportunities uh, anywhere in the world. But then over time, it's narrowed down to focusing on the developing world and I guess very often health charities. Is that right? Uh, yeah, so I think that's fair. We, we also uh, recommend charities that are focused on increasing uh, consumption or, or income for individuals, but, but a lot of our work's in health. Um, and that's just because that's where you found kind of the, the best giving opportunities or, or the ones that, that meet your criteria. Yeah, so that's right. So I think, um, and I, I'm not, you know, I'm not entirely clear on the history here because I've only been working at, at GiveWell for one year, but it started off as a kind of, you know, let, let's find uh, outstanding giving opportunities in a, in a wide variety of different causes. And over time, um, they kind of narrowed their focus. I think it was in 2011, although I'd, I'd have to check that, and, and kind of realized that most of the giving opportunities they were most excited about and where they thought they could have the, the most impact w- was in development. And I think the focus on health, I mean, one, one particular reason for that, I mean, other than it's just a really important thing, is, is the evidence base in, in health just tends to be much better developed than for other kinds of of things. And because we kind of generally focus um, on finding, identifying top kind of interventions or, or types of program, th- th- there tends to be more homogeneity between different health programs than you might expect in kind of other, uh, other areas. And so that makes it a lot easier for us to find kind of priority programs. So a lot of people say that GiveWell is looking for like the best charities or the top charities, which is kind of true. But um, in fact, you're, you're looking for like charities that meet particular criteria, right? Yeah, so our kind of three main criteria are cost effectiveness, uh, evidence of effectiveness, and uh, kind of transparency, commitment to monitoring and evaluation. So it traditionally, kind of in the past, we have focused largely on charities that are providing quite direct uh, services to people. So things like anti-malarial bed net distribution or, or deworming. Um, and the reason for that is we, they're, they're generally a lot easier, at least relative to some kinds of giving opportunities, to really give the full rationale for that online. So I'd, I'd say insofar as GiveWell is restricted in the kinds of things we're looking for, it does tend to be that that restriction tends to be we don't want that our, our giving opportunities to rely on maybe kind of idiosyncratic worldviews that not a lot of people share or kind of things which are de- very difficult to justify online so th- that's the kind of main constraint we we face and you know and, and we're still kind of working out how far we want to push outside that so i guess you could say you're looking for the most cost effective charities where you're able to demonstrate that they're actually cost effective with with a high degree of confidence yeah so i, I think that's that's like 90 percent right i think there's a bit of nuance here about what it is to kind of demonstrate with a high degree of confidence so for example deworming is an intervention where we're, we're not particularly confident about the evidence base but we are kind of confident at the higher level about our, our rationale for it 
and and so you know we're willing to to accept some degree of risk but I, I think it's maybe rather than thinking of it as a kind of risk aversion constraint it's more about can we explain this based on you know reasons that we think that you know other reasonable well-informed people would come to the same conclusions so can't kind of just be an idiosyncratic opinion that that James has about you know uh, which which policies are going to be useful, which you, which you can't then convince other people of. Yeah, as much as I'd love love for it to be that, it doesn't tend to work. I guess um, you know as well, and this isn't to say that you can eliminate all judgment calls because there are kind of you know it, it's almost impossible. Well, it is impossible to do that, but it's about making judgment calls that we think that you know other people, other reasonable, well informed people would probably make similar similar calls. Yeah. So how many people work there these days? It's gotten quite large recently. Uh, yes, we've got, got slightly more than 20 people working for us right now. So, you know, maybe you know, not as large as, as mega foundations, but maybe large for an effective altruism organization. Um, and that's roughly split between research and operations. So, so it's slightly more than 10 in each. Some of the researchers also spend their time kind of working on outreach and, and speaking to donors. Um, which we find, you know, we find for this outreach work, it's kind of important that our front-facing staff are really familiar with our research because that's what a lot of the outreach involves. And how much money is Gifo moving these days? Yes, yeah, so we move about $100 million a year. And that's, uh, we, we don't have our full figures in um, for last year yet. But the last two years, that's remained relatively stable. Um, we, we did decline slightly, uh, I think it was last year. But that was that was based on a decline in, in large donors, so those giving a you know reasonably large amount. When and that you know our, our best guess is that that's likely to be noise. But we still saw kind of you know, decent growth amongst smaller smaller donors. So in terms of smaller donors, we've been growing quite quite steadily. So you've been a research consultant there for about a year. What sort of projects have you been working on since you joined? Well, when I first joined, um, and that's kind of reasonably easy for me to remember. When you, when you first join GiveWell, it's, it's all about finding the right fit. So you're just trying to work out what you're good at and where you can add the most value. So we well, worked on a bunch of different things early on. Uh, so one is kind of quick evidence assessments, which are these kind of four hour initial scans we do into a particular kind of intervention where we you know we don't read the papers in detail but we grab out the abstracts and kind of try and get a sense of what the evidence base looks like for this program um so that's qeas that's a kind of very common kind of work you would do as a researcher at give well another is writing interim intervention reports this is a stage before our full intervention reports but you know beyond our quick evidence assessment where we spend you know somewhere between 15 and 40 hours kind of summarizing that evidence and, and putting it online so I, I did work on that for eyeglass distribution and, and antiretroviral therapy and there's also you know i've done some deeper review of the evidence base for some of our top charities, in particular seasonal malaria chemo prevention, which is one of our top programs. And also quite, quite early on, I spent quite a bit of time working on a grant investigation that I brought over with me from my previous role at the Center for Effective Altruism. Kind of another piece of work was working on more kind of conceptual questions around our cost effectiveness analysis um, and writing a few kind of blog posts to make our, our thinking about those questions explicit. So kind of what I'm spending time on at the moment, it, it seems like the best fit for me and you know what GiveWell would best be served by me doing at the moment is kind of these big open-ended investigations. Uh, into giving opportunities which are quite different from what we're currently doing. Um, so I'm spending most of my time looking at different kind of policy-based opportunities, uh, but also doing some more kind of process-style work about what our research strategy should be and how we're performing against the expectations we set last year. So that's quite a wide range of uh, projects. Uh, do, do people typically jump around between different different topics that much in GiveWell? Yeah, so I think kind of certainly early on. Like, you know, when, when we first joined, we were optimizing for just really exploring and like understanding what we're best at. And as I've been there longer, my work has tended to be more focused. So over the last few months, I've really been focused mainly on these these policy policy opportunities. But we are, you know, people really don't have, you know, very fixed roles. And we do we do jump around quite a bit. Recently, you published a, a blog post on GiveWell's site talking about your approach to kind of cost-effectiveness analysis and especially the uncertainty and kind of sensitivity analysis that you have to do to figure out how confident you are in the figures that you're citing on how effective these charities are. Broadly, what was the case that you were making in, in, that, in that blog post? Yeah, so I think what we're really trying to do with that blog post is, is just present some of the sensitivities in our cost-effectiveness analysis and show kind of how uncertain we are about these things. Um, I think that can be a tendency when people see that we, we put a number on you know, our best guess of you know, how cost-effective a charity is. I think when you put numbers on things, people tend to interpret that as, you know, this is it, this is a result, this is science. And you know, we try and be as scientific as possible, but I, I think what we really want to be is, is as explicit as we can about you know, not just how uncertain 
uncertain we are, but why we're uncertain. You know, the, the basics of that blog post was I was trying to explain, you know, how we account for uncertainty and also what are, what the most uncertain parameters in our cost effectiveness analysis were. So in terms of how we account for uncertainty, we, we try and get inputs from all our research staff for some of the most difficult things in our cost effectiveness analysis. So, so usually one or two who have the best context on that particular thing can discuss their findings to the team. And then we use a kind of wisdom of the crowds, evidence-based guess to come up with our kind of median estimate. So, so we have a bunch of empirical parameters. And also this is how we do our moral weights, which, you know, you might even say with the moral weights, that there might be no right answer to this. But we need some uh, we need some number to ensure we're making consistent decisions. And so we use the median of our, our staff's, you know, best evidence-based guesses. So just to make this more concrete, uh, say if you're looking into deworming, you know, there's various studies showing what is the potential health gain that, uh, that someone might get from receiving deworming tablets uh, if they have worms. But you're not sure quite how much to trust these. You might think some of the studies are better than others, or you might think that they're all overstated. And so you have to reach some kind of overall judgment about how large the effect is relative to, to the literature on this. And so a few people look into it and then you kind of, uh, they talk to everyone and then you do a survey ac- across all of the researchers to see what, what is their holistic judgment of this question and then you take the median? Yeah, that's basically right. So just to clarify on, on deworming. So again, it's, we actually, a very, very small proportion of the benefits that we estimate for our deworming charities are from improved health. You know, the, the vast majority of the impact, so I think over 90% is, is from long run increases in consumption. And so what we've done there is we, we've taken the, the headline results from the kind of the single long run RC, RCT, which looked at long run income. And then we thought about, you know, how, how we would discount that. Um, and that, that's what we call you know, internal validity adjustment is, you know, do we think that this study would have replicated if it was done, you know, perfectly in that context? And then the other part of that is external validity adjustments. So, you know, if, if deworming had this large effect in Kenya, it doesn't mean that it will you know, have it elsewhere uh, at different times and different places. Um, so these are the two kind of adjustments that we apply to various headline results. And, and I think this is somewhere we differ from published academic cost effectiveness analyses. So the things that are published in journals, which, which normally take the results of a study at face value. Um, and because we're trying to make decisions, we just need to make these judgment calls. And they're pretty difficult to make and they're pretty difficult to justify in a really objective way. So, for example, we, we've roughly divided the headline results of the bad uh, randomized controlled trial. So that's the, the study on uh, the effect of, of deworming on long run income. Uh, we, we've roughly divided that by five because we think the wider evidence base doesn't really support deworming. While we've only taken about 5% off the headline result of bed net distribution because there's a lot of randomized controlled trials on that and they generally find similar results. And, and so a lot of our staff kind of disagree about these. I don't think the world has worked out you know, exactly what the best way to interpret you know, evidence is, how much to trust a particular kind of trial. So, so they are kind of pretty subjective, but where possible, you know, we really do try and ground this and thinking about, you know, what our prior would be and how much each trial might update that and try and be explicit as that, uh, uh, about that as possible. So, so if you look in our, I, I think, you know, for donors who are really interested, you can see we've all put little notes on our, on the cell tabs in our cost effectiveness analysis for each of the parameters. And you can kind of trace back the rationale for why, why it is that we've chosen that number and, and not others. So uh, just to explain in, in, the, in that blog post, you link to the spreadsheet where you've got all of the different parameters that all of the different staff members estimated. I think it's 40 something different figures that, you know, I think 10 different staff members are trying to estimate. And and you've, you've each explained why you've chosen that number? Yeah, that's right. So, so I think one thing we are trying to do is, is reduce the number of things on that sheet. So it turns out some of them we, we did all agree on. It's also true that like some of them are kind of correlated. So the various deworming charities have some of the same inputs going in. But yes, I, I think something we have found is, is that that's very time consuming. And I think we do think it is worth doing for, for some things. Um, and we think for like other parameters, it might make sense to move some of them off the parameter sheet and just kind of take our best guess or the people who, who've been working on this for the longest take their kind of central best guess. So what are some examples of kind of the, the key uncertainties that you face that are, that are listed in that spreadsheet? Yeah, so, so one example would be um, the effect of malaria on uh, long-term income. Um, so I think that this is just a really difficult evidence base to assess, and we haven't completed a full review of it yet, but we do still need to make decisions in the short term you know, before we've done that. The evidence can broadly, there, there are four natural experiments which look at this, but they're mostly in TVVAX endemic countries. So that's a different type of malaria to what's prevalent in sub-Saharan Africa where our charities work. So people can have really different interpretations about what that effect might be and ha- how to apply that to our charities. So I think that that's an example of the kind of input that once we'd spent more time looking at it, we might well want to take away from the parameter sheet when we've done more work. But but until we've done that, we think the most robust decision rule we can use uh, in the short term is just taking the median of the best guesses of various staff members. 
Okay, so so once something becomes certain enough, then you just put in uh, a, f- a figure that the researcher has determined. But in as much as something's like very unclear, then then you use this kind of survey method. Yeah, so I, I think you know that would be the direction it would move in. I think there are a lot of a lot of things that we're unlikely to ever take off the parameter sheet. So the parameter sheet being the one where we use this kind of wisdom of the crowd estimate. So I think in particular, I, d- I doubt we'll ever have you know our certain moral weights that we all agree on. I think that's probably going to be something that we always use our kind of median estimates from our staff. But yeah, I mean, I can certainly imagine other things being taken off that sheet, um, either because we've just got a bit more certain about it, or because um, we just realized that even though we're really uncertain, most people agree about what their kind of best expected guess is. So can you just describe the, the process by, by which you come up with these with these numbers? So yeah, every year you produce these charity recommendations, and I guess you have to produce this these updated cost-effectiveness numbers for each of the charities that you're recommending each, each time in December when you update the charity recommendations. So there, is there some kind of crunch time in November where everyone has to come up with their estimates for, for these different numbers? Yeah, that's right. There is a crunch time. It's in November. And not a lot of us get a lot of sleep in that time. So, yeah, so we basically, we have an owner of the cost effectiveness analysis. So that's Chris Smith. Um, and he, he spends you know, a lot of his time working on, working on the spreadsheet. And so we, he, you know, he's generally in charge of just making sure everything's linked up properly and, and making sure that we're being consistent in our calculations and thinking about ways to improve that. So around about November, we all get together and discuss like various you know, different inputs. And this, this is kind of an iterative process. So we'll get together, discuss it, and then we'll try and identify which of the things that we really disagree about and what would change our minds. And then have these kind of conversations with each other where we kind of try and focus on the thing, you know, where, where two people disagree, we try and focus on you know, what would change each other's mind. And it's not always possible to drive like consensus on this. But that's our kind of broad approach. So we often still end up with large differences. And that's, that's just a result of different people having different, you know, maybe epistemics about what kinds of studies they trust or what their general prior for how much they should discount a particular intervention might be. But what we do find often is that the people who have you know, the greatest context and the, and the best knowledge of that particular intervention are often the ones who are kind of driving what the decision is there. So if you, know, if you look at the cell notes that we put in our latest cost effectiveness analysis, a lot of it will be like, you know, I am deferring to this other staff member because I'm convinced by their argument rather than everybody doing everything completely independently. So not everyone has the time to look into all of these different numbers. So they what, pick a few where they think that they have an edge at producing a better estimate and look into those a lot and then try to convince others? Yeah, so I think that's something we're trying to move towards. I think at the moment we probably do spread ourselves too thin. And that, that's kind of my view. That's not the give well consensus view. And, and so I think it would be you know, pretty helpful if we had owners of each parameter who, who you know, the people who are in charge of that. And now, now I still think it is worth, you know, everybody putting in their best guesses, but, you know, having a few people who are really responsible for like making the case. So I think, you know, one advantage of weighing the subject expert more is they just, you know, generally like have the best context, right? And you want to, you want to have the person who knows the most about something making a decision. I, th- I think a disadvantage to getting the subject expert kind of weighing their, their opinion more is it, it'll often penalize analyze an intervention if if that subject expert is generally just somebody with a skeptical prior. So I think it's important that they're making the arguments um, and kind of laying out what the most important considerations are. But I also think it's important that everybody, you know, has input onto what the value would be. So so the problem is there is if you have different researchers looking into different numbers and one of them is just temperamentally very pessimistic, then that can kind of drive down the cost effectiveness for the intervention that they happen to be studying. And that's just a random happenstance, really. Yeah, so that would be something we'd really want to avoid and something that could happen if we just you know, gave ownership entirely to one person. So, so which of these numbers did you find uh, hardest to estimate last November? Was there one that you were kind of tearing your hair out about or <laughs> having sleepless nights? Right. Yeah. So I, I think we covered one already, which was the long-term effects of malaria on income. That was one. I'm trying to think of what another good example would be. Yeah. So I, I think the discount rate is a pretty interesting one. So the discount rate, that's basically the percentage discount that we apply you know, when benefits are realized in the future. So for example, a 3% discount rate would mean that we'd value the benefits in one year's time at about 97% as much as the benefits now. So I think there's lots of different considerations that can go into you know what you think the discount rate would be so one would be you know if people get income earlier in life then they can presumably invest that and gain some return on it another might be uh you know some people might you know value 
helping people just sooner you know other people would just think that's just a present bias and, and we shouldn't take that into account so everybody's taken slightly different things into account we tried to make that explicit when we've done that but we still ended up at quite a wide range so you know, three to six percent which doesn't sound like a lot but when you compound that over many years it makes quite a big difference to how effective you think uh, deworming might be um, so that's something that i think we haven't really reached consensus about and then when we've reviewed how other people think about discount rates we, we've realized that you know nobody else has really got a good consensus on this either so i think that's something that we'd, we'd like to look into more yeah the, the discount rate is super tricky i think we'll have to have a an episode about that at some point because there's so many different considerations that point in all kinds of different directions and i don't really have a have a great view on, on, on what exactly it should be uh, either um I think, I think that episode could end up going for two or three hours <laughs> yeah i think that would be i'd listen to it i think I, I, yeah one thing i would highlight is that we generally the discount rate as it's used in our model is generally applied to increases in consumption rather than to health benefits and that's that's not actually kind of an explicit decision we've made it just happens to be that the charities that we I think have this kind of long run impact. It tends to be income that we're bundling in the long term. Whereas with malaria, that tends to be something that happens. You know, if, you, if you hang a net this year, it's you know, you're, you're probably going to prevent a case of malaria this year. So as, as it happens, yeah, the discount rate should be thought of as applying to, to raises in income rather than health. So all of this was a bit of a preamble to discussing the sensitivity analysis that you did, where, where you took kind of the range of the different estimates that, that the different staff members had, and then saw how much that affected the outcome. Do you, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so there are two kind of broad ways you can do a sensitivity analysis. So one is an all things considered sensitivity analysis. And, and this might be a Monte Carlo simulation. So you, you'd put probability distributions over like every parameter, and then you'd randomly sample from those parameters somewhere along the probability distribution, like you know, hundreds and hundreds of times. And, and it kind of spits out a probability distribution at the end. And this gives you some sense of, of how uncertain you are, all things considered, in your model. Although I would caveat that it doesn't really account for maybe the most important kind of uncertainty, which like, is the structure of the model right? Are you even putting the right parameters in here? And I think that's actually a big part of the uncertainty we have. So we actually, we were trying to achieve a slightly different thing with our sensitivity analysis, which was trying to work out which parameters are our models most sensitive to. And that allows us to work out, well, it allows us to do two things. So first is just communicate to donors why we're uncertain, which I, I've always found is a far more compelling thing than just saying, you know, we're really uncertain. So, well, tell me why. What, what are the things that you, you're not really sure about? And the second is allowing us to prioritize, you know, what are the things that we need to spend more time thinking about or doing research on? Um, so I think it's most useful from, from that perspective, kind of thinking about you know, what should we be spending time on? And it turns out, I mean, there are a few things that our model's highly sensitive to. So, so two of them we've covered already. So, you know, the long run income gains from malaria prevention, the discount rate. I think another one is, is fairly obvious and fairly controversial, which is the correct replicability adjustment to apply to the deworming study. That's something we've, you know, that's probably the thing that GiveWell as a whole has spent most time thinking about over the course of its you know, 10 years, I, I would guess. And so we're, we're constantly trying to think of ways that we could get more information on this, or, although a lot of avenues that we've, we've looked at just haven't ended up being that promising. So that's another one. And, and then I think you know, the, the obvious one is just, it turns out which charities you think are most cost effective are just extremely sensitive to what your moral weights are on different kinds of good. And our staff disagree on that to a large extent. And, and you can see, you know, if you, if you go to that blog post, we've got a chart where we look at, like, if you flexed the value of uh, doubling consumption for one person for one year compared to preventing the death of an under five child. And if you, if you took that value and you flexed it between the person who's most, who thinks that's highest, who'd be most pro doubling consumption for, for people versus the people who'd be most pro preventing the death of an under five child, you just get these huge bounds on how cost effective our charities are relative to each other. So yeah, let's talk about some of these uh, moral weights as opposed to empirical weights. How do you go about estimating the value of these different benefits and harms? You know, do, do you kind of look at surveys of what the recipients would, would value and how they would weigh, weigh it off? Or do you just have to kind of decide yourself? Yeah, it's a good question. So actually, that's something that we're, we're currently partnering with ID Insights to run exactly this survey. This is something we're quite excited about. So, so I think there's a question, there's like a really high level question about you know, whose values should we be using to like you know, make our best guesses. So, you know, uh, one, you might think the beneficiaries are the values we should care about. Secondly, you know, maybe our staff are the best people to be making this decision. Thirdly, our donors um, or fourthly, maybe some like idealized consensus of like all people or, you know, what do other major prioritization organizations, what are the, how do the World Health Organization make this trade off? 
that kind of thing. And so I think, you know, at the moment we do it for our own staff, but, you know, trying to take into account these various other data points. Um, we, we have asked our donors, or, you know, we've, we've surveyed a few of our donors and generally got the impression that, that most people just don't have numbers in mind, which is just consistent with my, you know, understanding of how people think, right? It's like no one's, not many people are walking around with this figure in their mind of how they would, you know, how they would value preventing a death compared to increasing somebody's consumption. You know, th- this, is, this is not true for some of our donors, some of our really engaged donors. I'd really encourage them to uh, go to our spreadsheet and just input their own values and see how that changes the answer. I think it's quite unlikely that we'll end up um, investing a lot in trying to elicit our donors' weights because we just don't think, you know, most people have a good answer there. We have invested quite a lot in trying to understand like how other organizations make these decisions. And so there's a few different ways you can think about this. So the, the World Health Organization has these thresholds for what they consider a highly cost-effective intervention in terms of dollars per dolly. So anything which is more than three times GDP per capita per disability-adjusted life year is, is not a cost-effective use of money in that in that country and anything which is you know between one and two would be considered pretty cost effective you know there's another question about like what does that actually mean like pretty cost effective versus not cost effective and and i'm not entirely sure how well like whether those thresholds are really used in practice because you know it just depends on your your budget i guess so so that's kind of one input you can also look at kind of stated preference surveys or or, um, revealed preference surveys so there's a very famous study i forget i forget the name now but it looked at kind of different occupations and tried to come to an estimate of you know how much people are willing to pay to avoid uh, a micro mort, so you know a very small chance of death, and, and you could use that to think about like how to trade off consumption against survival against survival. Yeah, and and so one big problem we've seen is a lot of this literature is based on developed countries, and so that's why we're doing this kind of work with ID Insight to go into an area of Kenya where we think the people there are, are quite likely to be you know, they're, they're relatively similar to our typical beneficiaries, um, although you know that's obviously still a huge generalization. Um, and so we're, go- uh, you know, ID Insight are going in there and asking them questions about how they would make these trade-offs, and we hope that that might be useful in us thinking about well, what the people we're trying to help actually value. Um, I think kind of one problem with this is it's pretty hard to ask like most people these these questions, and you know, particularly to try and get people thinking in a pretty consequentialist or utilitarian mindset. So I think that's something that's likely to be quite challenging. Uh, so we'll we'll see how that goes. So just to make it more concrete, you're weighing up things like uh, increasing someone's income versus the risk of them dying uh, versus the risk of maybe their child dying versus uh, perhaps like direct suffering from disease. Uh, Those are the kind of things that you're that you're weighing up and trying to say, well, you know, 10 10 of this is worth, you know, two of that. Uh, Yeah, that's right. So one of the most controversial ones would be, you know, what's the value of preventing a death at a particular age relative to preventing the death at another age? And and so this is quite interesting because I think the global health community generally has a way of thinking about this, which is a disability adjusted life year or the the quality adjusted life year. We actually, um, we we don't use that anymore as a kind of baseline for, for our own moral weights. Um, and the reasoning for that is that it turned out that a lot of our staff actually value preventing the death of an adult more than they value preventing the death of a very young child. And so we really want our staff to say what they really believe rather than just going along with whatever, you know, the normal position is. So, you know, you can't count for that within a disability adjusted life year framework that preventing the death of an adult is more valuable than preventing the death of a child. You can, you can kind of discount each marginal year. But you can't say that these extra years are essentially negative. Um, so, so we stopped using that, and now we all have our own kind of ethical ways, uh, our own ethical systems that we use to prioritize you know, lives at different ages. And I, I, I can kind of speak to my own one, which is very briefly based on uh, the time relative interest account, which is an ethical theory by by Jeff McMahon. And I think this allowed me. So, and Andreas Morgensen has a really nice paper on his website where, where he kind of formalizes this. Where and the, the basic idea is that there are maybe two things that are bad about dying, or there are lots of things that are bad about dying. But one is the kind of you know, how many years of life that you lose, and the other is the kind of how much interest you have in those future years of life. And so, this I think helps account for like my intuition that I don't, don't feel particularly strongly, but that preventing the death of a very very newborn child might actually not be you know so much more valuable than preventing the death from an adult so you take you, you take the kind of number of expected years of life left and you multiply it by this kind of pretty subjective factor which basically accounts you know does this person have cognitive function can they make plans are they like a functioning agent in the world 
Um, and you multiply those two things together to get something that looks kind of roughly, you end up with a roughly log normal distribution over age. So the death of a very young child is something I would, I would value you know, relatively less than, um, and I think my, my peak value is the death of, of an eight-year-old, I think is you know, where I end up. But other people have really different. That, that's when it's the worst for them to die. Uh, that's when it's the worst on my, on my values, yes. I actually don't think that that explains people's intuitions. I'd be more inclined to look at uh, evolutionary psychology. Uh, I've, I've seen a paper that uh, says that if you, if you survey uh, people, it's coincidentally, the age that they think it's worse for someone to die is also the age at which it's worst from the parent's reproductive fitness point of view. Uh, so if like someone dies when they're, when they're 16, then you, you've invested all of these resources in raising this child to reproductive age. Um, that you that you can never get back, and then they die as soon as they might start being independent and start having children themselves. And so, if you just think about it from an, ev- an evolutionary point of view, you know, uh, uh, in terms of maximizing the propagation of our genes, at what age is it worst for our children to die? It happens to line up extremely well with where people morally think it's worse for them to die, which um, m- makes makes me suspicious. I guess that um, it's actually uh, moral philosophical issues going on here, rather than just uh, you know m- maybe more biological issues actually. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think there's another thing you might point to, which is that you know back in caveman times, you know, very very young children actually had a lower life expectancy, um, remaining life expectancy than you know maybe medium aged children. And so you know from again from a reproductive fitness point of view, you want, once you, you know, nurture a child to the age of ten, say they then matter to you more than you know a very very young child. And so yeah, I do, I do think it's a good point is that you kind of you know once you start to realise how much your intuitions are just influenced by you know not just this kind of coincidence of evolutionary psychology, but also this coincidence that just like doesn't even apply anymore. That really does make you question your own uh, intuitions. And so this is something, yeah, this is something I'm struggling with at the moment. I mean, there's another perspective on this I, I find quite persuasive, which is, you know, say that you were to take, you would say that the value of preventing a death is just purely linearly associated with the expected years of life remaining. I think you do have this problem of, okay, when do you start counting or like when does life start? Because you're going to get a sudden flip from zero to 80 years of expected life at that point. Well, exactly. Yeah. So that does seem, you know, kind of weird, right? And so it seems this discontinuity just doesn't seem like something that we'd want to have in an ethical system. I don't know if I've really, you know, fully, fully justified that in my own mind. But, but one advantage, I think, of this, of Andreas's formulation is, is you do get this kind of gentle, well, there's quite steep slope up, but still a slope when kind of, you know, you might think a fetus starts to gain, you know, at some point they start to gain like some cognitive function. So they're like a little bit worth it or, you know, gain, gain some value and, and you don't get this kind of big jump, you know, which, which seems unlikely to be at birth. And we haven't really pinned down exactly. My understanding is we haven't really pinned down exactly when that is. I guess on the total consequentialist view that I'm inclined towards, it starts even before birth, that it could be valuable to create someone even before they exist, uh, potentially, if their life would be good. That gets around the discontinuity, but is counterintuitive in a different way. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I, it's interesting. I think another thing that I've been kind of struggling with, and this is all kind of my own personal moral reflections, I think, rather than certainly not the kind of the give well consensus view, is, is I, I find myself quite persuaded by a lot of the total utilitarian arguments. I think there's a question here about like, and I'm not sure if this even makes sense, but maybe using the right tool for the job. And it feels like, you know, once we start making our moral weights on total utilitarian grounds, then everything gets a bit wacky. Yeah. Well, you'd have to change other parts of your model as well. Yeah. And so it might just be that kind of give wells thing like isn't, it's just not based, like our product isn't based on a total utilitarian perspective. And so even if, you know, my own personal views like place quite a lot of credence on that, I wonder if it's maybe not... I, I've kind of set that aside when I was thinking about what I should do for like from the perspective of Givewell. Another kind of controversial moral issue that you guys will encounter is suicide versus involuntary death. Have you discussed that a whole lot because you were um, supporting the uh, the, the anti um, pesticide suicide group? Yeah, so this was this was probably the most controversial of any of our moral weights. So yeah, I, I know this. I know this issue is controversial with my friends whenever it comes up. Yeah, it is. It's really something that sparks people, and and I think you know fairly, it's it's a very it's a very difficult thing to talk about. I think neutrally. So I, I think maybe if I give a bit of background about you know the organisation that we ended up making a grant to, and that'll maybe give a bit of you know perspective on which we can kind of think about this kind of moral question. Um, so so we made a grant of about one point three million dollars to the Centre for Pesticide Suicide Prevention, uh, and I won't go through the full evidence base, but basically the the idea is that um, they're going to go into India and Nepal and work out you know which pesticides people are using. To, to attempt suicide and what the case fatality of those different pesticides are. So, so for context as well, we think that you know, about 800,000 people a year die from suicide and somewhere between 100,000 and 300,000 of them are through pesticide. The data is that bad that we, 
it, it's quite hard to narrow down closer than that. So this is a kind of very common uh, method of suicide, particularly in agricultural communities in developing countries and particularly in, in um, South Asia and, and Southeast Asia. So basically the mechanism here, there, there's two possible mechanisms. So one is that you're, you're making a common and lethal form of suicide more difficult to access. And that might reduce the amount that people have this kind of very easily available method of suicide in front of them. And, and then the other method is the other possible mechanism. And we're not really sure which of these is, is more likely. And um, the other possible mechanism is people are still attempting suicide, but they're doing it with less toxic pesticides or you know, pesticides which are less likely to kill them. And so they generally, you know, they'll have a higher chance of getting through that period and then hopefully, you know, go on to make a full recovery. So I think there's... There's a big thorny argument here about like how valuable it is to prevent suicide because you're not treating these people, you're not treating them for like mental health disorders, you're essentially just preventing them dying. And so I think this is an interesting one because two of our staff actually place zero weight on preventing a suicide through means restriction. I, I think there is a decent argument there. A, lo a lot of it kind of depends on what your definition is of a life worth living. And I'm not sure like anyone has a really good answer to that. But there is also like a lot of empirical information which is relevant. So I, I think this kind of highlights the nature of these conversations, which is like a lot of times it's just going to be dominated by your ethical view. But other times it really does seem like, you know, there's actually evidence we can go out into the world and, and like find out which it should change our mind. Something that I'm very interested to know is when you have these conversations about these moral issues, can you find dialectically persuasive arguments? Are there things that you can say that, that move other people or is everyone just kind of entrenched in, in their own moral intuitions? Yeah, it's a good question. So I moved around a bit on this, uh, and, a, and a few other staff did as well. My recollection is that uh, most, most staff stayed pretty entrenched. Having said that, I think that is we only ask for people to put down their views after we've had that initial discussion where we present the evidence. So it's not necessarily that people aren't responding at all to the evidence. It might just be that they're not you know, changing their minds about like, new evidence. And, we, and there's a reason we do that, which is that you know, I think once people write a number down, it's just human nature to just feel like quite defensive about that number. And so it's, it, things generally seem to go better if you like present the evidence first and then think about it. Do people think about the effects of um, a suicide on the children or, or the family of the person who, who dies? Yeah, so I think some of our staff did take that into account. It actually wasn't a, um, a key consideration for me. And, and maybe, you know, maybe that's wrong. Um, I, I guess my perspective is generally that um, I, tend to, I tend to value these things because of the effect on the person. And I, I wonder if the kind of, you know, this, the sense of, of grief that, that family members might feel, a, a lot of that grief comes from a place of like, I am sad because a bad thing has happened to somebody I care about. I was I was actually thinking more from the perspective of if, if a parent dies, then the children might grow up in, in more dire poverty. Yeah, right. Of course. Yeah. So that's relevant. Um, I wonder. So it's not, yeah, that's not something that played a key role in my decision. But I, I guess kind of that consideration should lead me to rationally kind of move it up a little bit. So, so what we were doing was comparing it to preventing the death of an adult from malaria because they're quite similar age, age bounds. And so the answer we got was about 70%. So it feels like these considerations might apply to both. Right. So perhaps it cancels out. Yeah, but then you might say, well, okay, well, if, if this consideration applies equally to both, then, then that would lead you to like raise the percentage that, you, that you're assigning to like the value of preventing a suicide, uh, preventing a suicide relative to preventing a death from malaria because you know if they apply equally to both so you're not kind of discounting that bit and then I, I guess maybe there's an argument about well you know you, you might think that people who attempt suicide and then go on to survive because you know they haven't taken the right pesticide might not be you know great providers for their family you know i, I don't know this actually I, this is speculation but they might generally be people who who are likely to earn less like later in life say and so then you might say, well, actually, you know, this, that consideration is, should also be discounted. And I'm not sure whether that should be discounted more or less than the kind of other things that you would think about in making that comparison. So one thing I noticed looking at that spreadsheet is that most of the numbers that you're trying to estimate uh, are about estimating the effect of the intervention on the recipients who directly receive it, like the people who get uh, the deworming tablets or get the bed nets to protect them from malaria. And there's perhaps less attempt in the model to estimate what effect these different interventions might have on the development of a country over, you know, 50, 100 or 200 years. Is that something that you'd like to kind of estimate more or, or, or would you, would you uh, challenge, challenge my perception of it? Yeah, no, so I think that's right. I think there are kind of two ways that you can think about these, 
maybe long run flow through effects? Well, one is in terms of you know, how, how far they go into the future and the other is how, how easy are they to estimate? So we do tend to, we, we try to estimate into the future, but still relatively direct effects. So for example, our deworming charities, uh, you know, these kids are getting dewormed when they're young, but it's not till later that we expect that they might see a rise in income. So th- those effects are over multiple years. But you are right that we aren't, you know, we aren't thinking you know, maybe as explicitly as we should, although you know, that's, that, that's controversial as well about you know, w- what this effect might have on the long-term development of the country or something. And, and I think just a simple reason for that is, I mean, these things are really hard and we don't think we have strong evidence about what that might be. You know, there's a huge literature on, the, on this work and, and maybe we should prioritize looking into that. But it doesn't feel like, you know, it, at least in the short term, something that's likely to change our views hugely. So I, I, I kind of, I think an assumption that's slightly built into our model is, well, I'm not sure if it's an assumption because I'm not sure every staff member would just agree with this. But I think something that would make, that would push you in the direction of, of give well charities over maybe other options would be if you think there's this kind of trade-off where we think that the short-term effects of an intervention, which we might be able to make a pretty well evidence guess about um, are a pretty decent proxy for the for, for kind of the overall effectiveness of an intervention and I think that doesn't you know that certainly doesn't apply in all cases but when you're thinking about these kind of very difficult to estimate effects you're, you're making this trade-off here between you know having to make judgment calls based on very limited evidence versus potentially the kind of the long-run effects being the most important thing and so our we see our role you know largely as is using these kind of short-term effects as a proxy for what what we think um, might be best in the long run Okay, so I, I guess I, I kind of want to move on from this discussion of all of the of all of the uncertainties because we've got quite a few other topics to to talk about. I'll stick up a link to to that blog post and, of course, the enormous spreadsheet where you all offer your views and, and you show the mechanics of how you estimate the cost effectiveness of all of these different organisations, so people can can take a view and potentially uh, have a, have a play with the numbers themselves. What would you say, kind of, the, the biggest research priorities for for GiveWell as a whole at the moment? Uh, sure. Yeah. So I guess there's there's kind of four four main categories of you know, goals that we have of our research. So at, at a high level, so the first is kind of maintaining our current research project. So stay on top of our current top charities uh, and incubation grantees and uh, making prioritization decisions between them for our end of year giving season recommendations. The second, and, and that, that's quite a big part of, of what we spend time on. Um, so most most of us, I, that's actually the part that I'm less involved in, but a lot of a lot of research that give well work on that. I mean, as we've added new top charities, that, you know, that becomes a bigger and bigger task. Um, the second is prioritizing interventions we haven't looked at yet to find new priority programs. The third, and this slightly overlaps with the second, is, is kind of maybe building for future years. So things that aren't likely to lead to top charities in the next couple of years, but could have a really big impact on GiveWell's recommendations over kind of longer time scales. So that's a lot of our kind of incubation grant work. And the fourth is kind of cross-cutting. So improving the tools we use, improving the methodology. And I've done a bit of work on this. So kind of conceptual questions related to our cost effectiveness analysis and improving the way that we think about how we might weigh, for example, particular qualitative factors into our decisions and kind of trying to do that in a consistent way. So GiveWell doesn't really do kind of global cause prioritization, you know, weighing up poverty reduction versus other other causes. Uh, I think that that's basically gone over to, to the Open Philanthropy Project, which is broken off. But you still do kind of prioritization between different sub causes, uh, even though you're not prioritizing between all the different causes. There's still going to be a lot of prioritization work between kind of different sub areas within within poverty reduction and global health. So you think about like, you know, do we want to lean on improving life expectancy or improving quality of life or improving income or improving improving education there's still kind of yes yeah, sub sub course prioritization to do right uh yeah i think that's right so so that's kind of our, our main area of, of expertise and what, what we do so we're not working on the very high level different types of causes so you know, animal welfare or global catastrophic risks because we think there are other really good organizations working on that so you know, open fill is one um and some of the folks at center for effective altruism as well so so our work tends to be about prioritizing at the kind of lower level so within global health and development what are the best giving opportunities we can find um, we do kind of periodically reconsider whether we should be working outside global health and development. We don't really have any plans to do that in the near term. Um, so I think in terms of different, the, the way that we prioritize within global health and development is we tend to focus on uh, interventions rather than particular kinds of causes. So what specific things can we do? You know, how, how cost effective is a particular kind of program or, or a solution rather than focusing on the problems? Um, and I think there are kind of two two reasons that that's a good way of splitting up the case. So one is that we think the different different kinds of interventions, there's a lot of variance between them in terms of their cost effectiveness. And the second is it's relatively well, you know, relatively easy to evaluate the differences between those types of interventions. Um, whereas you know, when you're focusing on a particular disease, uh, there might be kind of very different kinds of interventions there. 
And it really does bottom down to like, well, what's the most effective intervention you can do to prevent that problem? So for our direct work, that's why we tend to prioritize at the intervention level. So between you know, bed net distribution, uh, deworming and antiretroviral therapy, rather than at the problem level. So between malaria, um, worms and, and HIV. Um, and because there's just a lot of information out there that lets us get a handle on which interventions are likely to be most cost effective. And you, and you can see these kind of big differences between them. And I think prioritizing at kind of the problem level is a more difficult question. It really bottoms out at how you know, cost effective the best interventions are. And so, you know, that's a good place to start by identifying priority interventions for us and then finding charities doing those things that meet our standards for kind of transparency and, and monitoring and evaluation. And we're also working in the right geographic locations right? because anti-malarial bed net distribution wouldn't be very cost effective in the UK. So, so I think, yeah, I mean, there are lots of different ways of, of sort of dividing this space. And, and, you know, you might go higher than the intervention level and you might say, well, one, one thing we could think about is you know, policy interventions versus direct interventions. And you could have a heuristic that said that one of those is much better. And so you should focus on those to have the most impact. But I think that question is really hard to answer at an abstract level. So our kind of our strategy here really is to look at some really promising interventions you could do in the policy space that we think might be you know, very cost effective. So we're thinking about you know, tobacco control or, or lead regulation and, and then do our best. And this is very difficult, but do our best to compare them with our top charities. And you're comparing things of very different kinds, but I, I do think it's possible to do that. So one of the most common uh, questions uh, I, I hear about GiveWell is how you think about you know the long term effects of, of these different interventions. So, so you just mentioned uh, lead reduction and, and smoking uh, cessation. You know, a lot of people would think, well, well, the lead one might be much more important than it seems because it kind of improves people's uh, you know edu- education in the long run or makes makes them more intelligent because they, they don't have lead poisoning. Basically, is there any way that you can take into account these kind of long term knock on effects from from the interventions that you're funding? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. So, so first, I'd distinguish maybe between two kinds of knock-on effects. So those that happen in the long term, which you, know, you might expect lead's effect on IQ and therefore income would be quite a long-term thing, or, or the effect of deworming on income is, is relatively long-term. Um, and that's one thing that people could call a knock-on effect. And then there's this other dimension which is correlated with it, but which is just you know how difficult is it to assess these effects? And obviously, it's harder to predict things in the long run, but the, these are slightly different questions, I think. So an example of the first would be you know, as I said, the effect of deworming on later in life income. Whereas an example of the second might be something like I don't know, the, the effect of increased voter empowerment on long-term democratic institutions and how that might affect economic institutions and kind of the long-run growth in countries. And those second questions are really difficult to answer well, um, which is not to say they're not worth answering well, but that, that's generally not our focus. So what have been the biggest changes in GiveWell's advice over, over the last couple of years? As a casual observer, it feels like things have become fairly stable, like your, your top few charities have typically been the same for, for a while now. Yes, yeah, so it's a good question. So I, I think the first thing to note is that we've added quite a few top charities to our list in the last two years. So we've added a couple of years ago, we added Malaria Consortium's Seasonal Malaria Chemo Prevention Program. Um, and then Site Savers and End Fund are relatively new additions. They both work on deworming. And then this year, or well, the end of last year, we added No Lean Season and Helen Keller International's Vitamin A Program. So we are adding charities to our list. Um, I think to the casual or even the quite attendant observer, that's been slightly obscured by our recommendations to donors being pretty similar each year. And I'd say to a large extent, that's kind of a coincidence. So it's, it's usually, you know, our recommendation has usually been along the lines of donate to AMF. And in fact, we, we ranked Malaria Consortium, No Lean Season and, and Helen Keller International's funding gaps above AMF at the end of last year. Um, and the reason we don't recommend that to donors is because we get, a, we get a large grant for disbursement from good ventures each year. And we use that to fill the highest priority funding gaps first. Uh, so last year, we filled those gaps and they recommend the next best funding gaps on our website, which means a lot of donors are probably thinking nothing's changed, which isn't quite right. So, so you found things that are better, but then you funded them from the grant from Good Ventures. And so what's left is kind of the, the, the large pool of money that Against Malaria Foundation needs. Yeah, that's, that's basically right. Yeah. And that's where you ask the, the broader audience to, to fund. Yes. And that wasn't a decision on like, you know, thinking it's logic coincidence. It's turned out that way. So, so I guess that's really good news then, in the sense that you found several charities that are that are better than what you were recommending before. Yeah, I think so. So, I, you know, I think the charities we've added are really exciting. I, I think there's a sense in which you can still say we are answering these kind of narrow questions. Uh, so, with the exception of No Lean Season, they're all organisations doing fairly direct health interventions with established evidence bases. Um, so, I do, I do think there is space for us to grow in terms of, kind of looking wider than what we've done before and thinking about very different opportunities. And so, one good reason for this is, you know, how we allocate our research capacity, given that we're funding constrained. 
Um, so I think just to simplify, there are two ways we could allocate our research capacity. So the first is kind of making sure all organizations that fit our current criteria are recommended. And we might expect them to be kind of you know, similarly cost effective to our current top charities. Whereas the second would be maybe doing more speculative research into areas that don't necessarily fit perfectly with our current criteria, but might be just substantially more cost effective than our current charities. And I think when you're funding constrained, that really pushes towards the second because the first would just be displacing funds from similar opportunities. And, and I think that's this kind of this question that we're asking ourselves. That there are kind of two roles for GiveWell. So one is a, a kind of objective recommender of really great charities. And I think it's really important there that your recommendations aren't path dependent. But the second is as a kind of crowdsource foundation. So trying to do as much good as possible with the money that we get. And that, that influences how you spend your research capacity. Because from the second perspective, there's just not a lot of value in identifying more funding opportunities that look like the Against Malaria Foundation on the margin. So, so just to explain that, you're saying if the Against Malaria Foundation hypothetically could absorb hundreds of millions of dollars of donations a year, and you're only moving $100 million a year, then there's not really much point finding, you know, even more capacity in another organization that's equivalently as good, because you're just not going to, you can't even fill the current bucket that you have of that kind. So instead, you want to try to find something that's that's more cost effective than the Against Malaria Foundation, maybe even if it's a bit uh, more of a risky bet. Yes, I think that's right. So so just to be clear, I, d- I don't think the Against Malaria Foundation could absorb hundreds of million dollars a year, but that's, yeah, that's that's the principle I'm gesturing at. So if Gives World's advice were going to end up being very different in a couple of years' time, uh, how, could, how could you see that happening and what, what organizations do you think might end up on that list? Yeah, that's a great question. I guess, I guess that's my job. Um, so I think there's a number of ways that could happen at a high level. So first is just identifying new charities you know, that look similar to our, our current top charities, you know, either through finding new organizations that, that we haven't you know, been able to get to apply before, or, or maybe some of our incubation grants resulting in top charities. But but maybe that's not what you mean by like very different. At some point, we're going to have to you know, end up taking top charities off our list if, if we continue finding really good opportunities, you know, either because we think they don't have a lot of room for more funding or, or because we've just found other better things, or you know, maybe because we've changed our mind about a key part of the evidence base. So you know, I, I think in terms of charities that are very qualitatively different to our current top charities, I, I think the policy space, I mean, my, my instinct is the policy space is the most likely place that that's going to come from. Okay, so potentially, you know, advocacy to change aid budgets or something like that. Uh, yes, it could be. It could be something like that. I mean, there's there's lots of um, different areas you could think about in policy. You know, if if you put it under the broad bucket of influencing what domestic governments or international organisations do, and so you know, one one way you could divide up the space is, you know, on the one hand, you have quite a lot of of health regulation. Right? I mean, things we take for granted in developed countries, so things like you know, laws to prevent the use of lead in paint. Or you know, regulation of, of particular methods of suicide, uh, tobacco control. Those are the kinds of things that only governments can really do. So that's that's one area we think could be very promising. And then another is this, you know, more evidence based policy work. I'd say, you know, the kind of work that you know, a lot of academics are doing. So you know, your J Pals of the world, your, your your IPAs, and you know, going out and trying to improve the way that, that governments use evidence. And I think there's there's you know tons of other things that you could think about in the in this space. I think those are the two that we're starting with and, and seeing where we can get with that. So the, the new charities that you added in the last few years were Nolene Season, Sight Savers, Helen Keller International, and Malaria Consortium. Is that right? Uh, yes, that's right. And also the End Fund, yeah, in the last few years. Do, do you want to just briefly describe uh, what those do and, and why they ended up being recommended and perhaps even regarded as more cost effective than, than AMF? Uh, sure. So uh, Malaria Consortium Seasonal Malaria Chemo Prevention Program. So basically what this is, is in some in some areas of, of sub-Saharan Africa, um, a, a high proportion of malaria occurs during the high transmission season. And in that in that period, it, it's pretty good you know, pretty good idea to basically give people uh, give children intermittent preventative treatment for malaria um, and you see these kind of very large reductions in the incidence of malaria from doing this um, so that, that's you know that's a program that's it's relatively new so i think it was only it was only a few years ago that this started that the global fund started spending money on this so we, we picked it up kind of quite early on there are a number of randomized controlled trials and a, and a Cochrane review published quite early. And so we've recommended malaria consortiums, seasonal malaria chemo prevention program now for, for two years. Um, and we think it's kind of roughly at similar levels of cost effectiveness to Against Malaria Foundation, which is interesting because I think a lot of that's driven by, or at least that, that's partially driven by uh, SMC is, is a program which has uh, received relatively little funding compared to uh, insecticide treated nets. And so the countries that malaria consortiums working in tend to be higher prevalence countries than, than, than Against Malaria foundation so even if even though you know in, in the abstract 
you know, for, in most countries, and it depends on you know, the various transmission mechanisms, but in most countries, you might prioritize nets above SMC. Um, in the countries where there are like funding gaps on the margin, they, they look pretty similar. Interesting. Okay. So SMC is kind of maybe less cost effective, all else equal, but it's more neglected. And so there's more opportunities to do it in places with, with high malaria prevalence. Yeah. So that, that's our best guess. And and there is kind of nuance around this. So, you know, where, where a particularly high proportion of malaria occurs during the high transmission season, that would be a time that, you know, those places would be places where SMC could have a particularly large impact. Okay, yeah. What are some of the others? Uh, yep. So No Lean Season is an organization that was an incubation grantee. Uh, and basically, they provide seasonal migration incentives uh, to people living in uh, rural Bangladesh. So during the lean season, it's, it's, it's not a great time for, for crops. And people who migrate to the city tend to, tend to earn a lot more. So this is a program that's run by Evidence Action, who, who also run our D1 The World, which is one of our top charities. Um, and they have run a bunch of randomized controlled trials showing that uh, people who are who, who are given this incentive to migrate are more likely to migrate and therefore have have higher consumption, and that outweighs you know the cost of, of providing this incentive. So, no lean season buys people a return bus ticket. Is that right to the city to you know um, to, to make money there and finding finding a job in the city uh, while they can't do farming, and then they come back on the bus and do farming during the season when uh, agriculture is more productive? Yeah, that's right. And so, I think there's you know there are a number of big questions kind of related to this grant, and it's it's something that you know I, I should say again I, I'm not the researcher who's best placed to talk about this, but I, I can kind of give you the overview. So, so one of the big questions is, you know, why is it that people aren't doing this anyway? Right. Yeah, it's quite it's quite an odd intervention in a way. Right. Right. And and so I think there's the the evidence about the the mechanism isn't completely clear. But if we were to take the most skeptical view, it would be well, you know, say, say that we're everybody is Homo economicus and we're modelling the world as an, as an economist, you know, a classical economist would. Then there's a very obvious reason why people you know wouldn't migrate to the city. It's just their revealed preference that there's such disutility from living in you know, these horrible cities um, that it's just not worth it for them. And if that was the case, then no lean season. You know, wouldn't be a great intervention because you're incentivizing people to do something that they don't really want to do, but they're doing it for that extra money. So that's possible, and I think there's, but but I think that's quite unlikely. So so one of the one of the adjustments we include in our cost effectiveness model now is kind of subjective adjustment for how how much worse you think you know life would be in the city, and you know different staff have very different views about that. I mean, I think there's there's another thing though, which is you know in my experience at least, people don't tend to be homo economicus, and and kind of providing this kind of relatively simple behavioral intervention can just change the way. That people think about things and and there are kind of various data sources i i'd encourage you know staff to uh well i'd encourage donors to to take a look at our intervention report there because we examine it in more detail there than i'd, I'd be able to give on this podcast okay sure do, do you feel able to, to speak to any of the, of the other new charities yeah so i think site saves and end fund the the rationale there was basically we we wanted to identify more room for more funding in, in deworming which is one of our priority programs so specifically combination deworming for schistosomiasis and, and soil transmitted helminths and, and those were organizations which were doing that. So they were, they were recommended very much on that basis. And, and the case is very similar to, uh, to the case for SCI and, and DUA in the world. And then Helen Keller International's Vitamin A program. That's Helen Keller International are an organization that we've been trying to get to apply for a while. And, and we were trying to find a good fit and a program that we could evaluate there. And so they provide uh, vitamin A supplementation to kids in areas where it's quite likely that people suffer from vitamin A deficiency. Um, and we expect that that has quite a high impact on cause mortality and might also have an effect on kind of the development effects of very young children. Uh, so, so actually, there's been quite a bit of turnover or qu- quite a bit of you know, discovery of new organizations that seem really, really cost effective. Yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, we, we've been quite excited because I, I think for a long time, GiveWell hadn't, hadn't found a new top charity and, and now we seem to be identifying them with, with a bit more regularity. I was worried that perhaps as a researcher in GiveWell, it felt now like you were just you know tweaking small aspects of the of the model for the charities that you already understood. But it sounds like you know there's there's reasonably good opportunities to to look into new areas and and, and have big big new insights. Yes, I think so, and I, I think we are we do feel we are at a point where you know it is worth kind of expanding what what we're looking at. But but at the same time, there are you know there are constantly new organisations coming up, and, and these aren't actually new organisations. I think a lot of the value here has been in as we've grown bigger and we're able to direct more funds. There's there's more incentive for, for established you know, big organizations to go through our, our process. So we've had quite a lot of success there with Helen Keller International being an example. So are there any charities that, that you personally think are really cost effective that, that GiveWell hasn't, hasn't funded yet? 
Yeah, it's a good question. So, so first of all, I, I guess the areas that I'm most, if, if I think there's a, there's a charity that has the potential to be really, really cost effective, um, I mean, that's likely to be the thing that I'm working on at the moment. And so these are mostly just things that we've touched on already, like during this conversation, which, which you know, I, I'm particularly excited by. And, and they're all in this kind of influencing policy space. So the first is an incubation grant we've already made um, to the Center for Pesticide Suicide Prevention. And so we don't recommend them as a, a top charity yet because it's a very new organization. So this was the first you know, significant funding that they've received, um, which was quite exciting because, you know, this is us starting a new organization from scratch. So, so we, we made an incubation grant there, and I'm happy to kind of go into more details on that later. Um, it's kind of a long, long story, that one. The second, you know, area that I'm excited about is, is tobacco control. So lo- lots and lots of people die from smoking every year. Uh, the question, I think the big question for us is if there's room for more funding. So, so Bloomberg and Gates are already doing this in 20 of the highest priority countries. So it really depends, you know, what that looks like on the margin. The third is lead paint regulation. So there's, there's pretty compelling evidence that lead paint is still one of the primary sources of lead exposure in the US. Um, and it seems likely that it could be a big problem in developing countries as well, although the evidence there is thinner. And there's also pretty compelling evidence that lead exposure leads to lower IQs. So I think that could be a really cost-effective thing to do to fund if it's done right. So basically going in, surveying paint manufacturer or or surveying paint that's sitting on shelves in countries and working out how much lead they have in there and then advocating for, you know, either new regulations or enforcement of of current regulations. And then then the fourth is this kind of, you know, maybe evidence-based policy. So there's various groups like JPAL, Innovations for Poverty Action, ID Insight, SEGA, Building State Capabilities and Evidence for Policy Design at Harvard and you know many more, which are trying to improve the use of evidence in policy decisions in, in developing countries. So I, I'm pretty uncertain about that one because you know it's, it's hard to evaluate the causal stories behind their influence. But it is an area that I'm, I'm excited about and, and I want to spend more time on. So kind of beyond those, and th- those are all things I'm working on at the moment, I, I'd want to think about things that are kind of really hard to evaluate but might have a huge impact. So you know, thinking about improving mi- macroeconomic policy or democratic institutions could be really good bets in the long term. Um, so obviously they're really hard to assess and I think reasonable people disagree hugely about what the best approaches are there. So I think our current strategy is to really start from where we are, which is these kind of relatively direct interventions, and then move outwards and see you know, how far our approach can take us. But I, I do certainly think there's a decent argument to be made for, for some of those areas at a very high level being you know, even better than our top charities. Do, do you mean macroeconomic policy in, in the developing world? Yes. Yeah, so I mean, there's a bunch of different ways you could think about this, right? So I'm, I'm not even sure macroeconomic is, is quite the right term. So, so one might be um, tax reform in developing countries. Which, which leads to sustainable financing of, of programs in the long run. Another one might be uh, you know, reducing agricultural subsidies in, in developed countries. You know, all of these areas that you kind of read about and have been written about from like a big picture development perspective for a long time, but we haven't spent that much time evaluating ourselves. Let's uh, move on now to talking about another blog post that you uh, published just a few days ago, actually, about uh, leverage and funging in the charities that you recommend. Um, could, could you describe what those two things are and, and why they matter to your recommendations? Sure. So uh, leverage and funding are two kind of jargony words we use to describe how a charity uh, causes other actors to spend their money um, in a way that they differently than they would have otherwise. Uh, So leverage is when a charity gets other actors to spend more money on the particular intervention than they otherwise would have. And funding is kind of the opposite of that. It's the flip side. It's when you you think you might be crowding out other actors from from funding that intervention. Um, So the two sides of the same coin. And I I think these are important because, you know, there's a lot of potential additional value there. If you're causing other actors to spend their funds on something more valuable than they otherwise would have, that that should be a good thing. And we we think that's something that, you know, charities should be rewarded for. Uh, And on the flip side, if we thought that without the Against Malaria Foundation, these nets anti-malarial bed nets would be fully distributed by the country governments. That seems like something we'd want to penalize AMF for. Okay, so in, in one case, if you spend money uh, delivering part of an intervention, then you might get the government to kind of match it and do the other half. In, 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 in the opposite case, it's possible that if you uh, go in and do something, then that means that the government just decides, well, they don't have to do this so they can spend the money elsewhere or maybe just give people uh, tax cuts. And so the money that you're spending could be basically offset by someone else withdrawing their funding. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, so how did you deal with that issue in the past and, and how has that shifted recently? Yeah, so in, in the past, we've counted all funds the same. So we've included all the costs of the intervention on the cost side, no matter who pays them. Um, so a concrete example is our, our deworming programs. So for example, for Schistosomiasis Control Initiative, SCI, one of our top charities, we, we estimate about a third of the costs are paid by SCI. 
And the rest of those costs are borne in either drugs donated by pharmaceutical companies uh, or the government costs, of which are basically comprised of, of the time the teachers spend distributing the drugs. Um, so what we used to do is just count all these costs as the same and try to work out the cost effectiveness from the perspective of that entire group of funders, which I think is a reasonable simplifying assumption. But it's maybe not the most accurate thing we're trying to do, because really what we're trying to get at is you know, how cost effective is it to donate to this particular charity rather than that group as a whole. Uh, and I guess one reason to to not really consider the, the leverage and funding is that it would give people the ability to kind of trick you by, say, taking a bunch of donations and then committing them to do half of it, and then saying, "Well, you're just going to fund the second half that will allow the first half to function," and they can uh, they they can make your fraction of it look twice as cost effective. Yeah. So this is a really big question, I think, which is like broadly something that's very difficult to think about conceptually. And it, you, you can think about this for like multiple things, right? How are we going to draw the boundaries? How, how are we going to draw the circles around like what the intervention is? And so, you know, at an extreme example, you might say, well, you know, the intervention isn't distributing these nets. The intervention is um, the whole world, like, you know, running all these randomized controlled trials, like developing the nets. And then you should include all of these costs on the cost side. But, but I feel like there's some kind of happy medium that you want to get to, which is saying, well, you know, it seems a bit absurd. Like, we, we know these RCTs exist in the world, and it seems unlikely, you know, we're not going to go back in time and that those costs would have been spent differently. So at some point, you do have to think about, like, well, how is the world, you know, as it currently is? Um, and I think it's this difficult balancing act that you've got to get. And I don't think there's necessarily kind of one strict correct answer, but it is at least something you want to consider. Okay, so now you're thinking about the, the, the extra money that's being brought in. And I guess you also then have to think about how that money would have been spent otherwise. That sounds pretty challenging to estimate both of those things. Uh, how, how, do, how do you actually do that? Yeah, so it's, it's hard. So I think this was one of the reasons we were reluctant to include this in our cost effectiveness model, because it is something that requires a lot more guesswork then, you know, maybe some of the more objective things that, that we estimate. On the other hand, we do think it is really useful to, you know, include these things in our model because we don't just want to know whether it matters, which would be, you know, what we'd be doing if we were taking it into account qualitatively. We also just want to like, you know, ideally we'd want to know exactly how much it matters or at least, you know, get a decent proxy for that. So I think it is, it is really challenging. So there are two parts to this. So one is, you know, what, what's the percentage chance that, you know, these, these distributions, say in the case of bed nets, wouldn't have been funded otherwise? And the other question is, you know, what would the money have been spent on? So with nets, we, have actually, we, we actually have a pretty decent answer to what's the chance that these, these distributions wouldn't have been funded otherwise. And so we've looked at the distributions that Against Malaria Foundation have considered and then didn't end up funding for like various reasons. And then we we look back at those distributions and we're like, okay, well, did they end up happening? And so what we found is about 40% of them did. So we're guessing that about 40 there's about a 40% chance that uh, the Against Malaria Foundation is you know, funging with other actors. Although if that happens, isn't it the case that those other actors, in the case where AMF funded the distribution, they, they then have more money to fund some other distribution elsewhere that you're not seeing? Yeah, so I think that's taken into account in our estimate of like what the counterfactual value of those funds is. Right, okay, yeah. So I think we aren't answering this perfectly because ultimately what we'd want to be doing is like estimating our general equilibrium effects. So, you know, how does, so, so every time you know, we shift funds to another thing, those funds also shift other funds and so on and so on and so on. Now, that's pretty difficult to do. So we think we're getting a decent proxy just going kind of one level down the causal chain. And I think on the, on the specific you know, AMF question, uh, if we fund a distribution and that means the global fund doesn't, does that mean they fund another distribution? Maybe. Um, and we did take that into account when we were trying to estimate the counterfactual value of, of global fund money. But, but at least in principle, you know, if, if everyone's perfect prioritizers, which, which is not the case, it would mean they'd funded a distribution kind of lower down in the lower prevalence area instead. So we th still think it would be like marginally less cost effective. And, and I think in practice, the global fund tends to set budgets at the country level for malaria. So it's quite likely that if the bed net funding gap was filled, they'd shift down to lower priority interventions in that country rather than provide bed net funding in a different country. And of course, you could say, in, you know, in the long term, all these things kind of shift around in a, quite a nebulous way. Um, so it is very difficult to come up with like precise, precise estimates here. So when you started taking into account uh, leverage and funding in this way, uh, how did it shift around the relative cost effectiveness of the different charities that you're looking at? Yeah, it's a good question. So so I don't actually have the precise numbers right in front of me, but it did make our deworming charities look quite a bit better. They're getting so much matching funding effectively from the pharmaceutical companies and the governments that do the distribution. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. And so, they, yeah, they have a high proportion of, of funding from other funders. I mean, I think another like high level thing was, I mean, this was part of part of the thinking for why, you know, I started to think about, or, you know, why people at GiveWell started to think that like, 
you know, maybe uh, these policy interventions might be, you know, a good option. Because if, if you were to, again, it's a question of how you draw the circles around, around the intervention. And it, it, so, so say that you, you know, you were getting, somebody could advocate, it cost a million dollars for a charity to advocate um, for a billion dollars to be spent on something like twice as effective. Now, what you could do is you could put like the million dollars on the cost side and then put the billion dollars on the cost side. And then your thing is looking like, it'd be like 2x good, right? Relative to like what that money was being spent on otherwise. But if you actually think like, okay, what we're putting on the cost side is just the $1 million and then we're getting that billion dollars to be spent like twice as effectively, then that looks like you know, one of the best things you could possibly do. And so that kind of influences how we think about, about those things. I think it didn't have, you know, we, we saw a small penalization to Against Malaria Foundation because we think it, it has this, a pretty high chance of of funding. And then uh, most of our other charities remained like pretty similar. So Helen Keller International, Give Directly, and, and Seasonal Malaria, Chemo Prevention, we didn't like, they're not leveraging huge amounts of government funding. And we also think it's quite unlikely that they're, they're funding, they're crowding out government spending. One thing that surprised me in that post was that it seemed like you thought that counterfactual government spending in, in the countries where your charities operate uh, would be, it's at 75% as cost effective as give directly, which gives cash transfers to extremely poor people. That seems like a fairly optimistic estimate to me of how effectively government spends money in, in countries like Kenya or, or India. Uh, was, was there much controversy about that? Yeah, so it's interesting. I don't think we're, um, we've discussed this enough internally, actually. So, I, I, you know, I'm, we're pretty uncertain about this. So, I'd, I'd appreciate your thoughts. Um, and I'd also really appreciate, you know, other people trying to, trying to do this kind of analysis and come up with their own figure. So, I, I can describe, you know, how we came up with that estimate and then maybe give like a couple of pushbacks against why that might not be like overly optimistic. So, we came up with our estimate by looking through domestic government spending on, on different social education and health programs. Um, and then just putting down our best guesses of how cost effective we thought each of those things were. So this is like obviously extremely difficult because we haven't in looked like in depth at a lot of these programs. But we do have, you know, we built up quite a bit of knowledge of, of like various big, big parts of particularly health spending. And so we can you know, come up with estimates which are better than, you know, made up, but aren't precise. So, so we're kind of taking that as a working guess. And I, I would love to, you know, spend more time on that or for other people to kind of come up with their, their valuations there. I, I guess the, the, the way that it's surprising, perhaps, is that in the past, GiveWell has said that Give Directly is a really, you know, outstanding charity that's spending money, you know, extremely effectively relative to, to, to many other charities. But th then it only it seems, according to this estimate, that it's 33% more cost effective than just like marginal, general, extra government spending. In, in that context, it seems a little bit surprising. It, it, would, it would suggest that Give Directly is like not that much of a standout charity relative to just other things that people do in the developing world. Yeah, it's good. It's a good point. So, I think maybe my first pushback would be that against Malaria Foundation, according to our cost effectiveness estimates, we estimate it's about four times as good as Give Directly. So that'd be about five times better than you know marginal government funds, for example. And, and we use Give Directly as this kind of baseline. And actually, a lot of our rationale for Give Directly and recommending them as an organisation is they score so highly on our other criteria. Um, which aren't actually built into our cost effectiveness analysis. So their monitoring and transparency is superb. And, and the relative simplicity of their intervention also means that kind of from a model uncertainty perspective, we think there are just less things that could go wrong. Um, and we don't have a precise estimate for like how much better this makes them than the cost effectiveness analysis makes them look. But we do think they are. So I have to be careful here because I think different people might you know, different people at Give Well might interpret this actually differently. But I think most of us would say we would prefer that $4 went to Give Directly than $1 went to AMF. And so this is a sense in which, you know, we're not taking our cost effectiveness analysis completely literally. So I think that's one point. And then the other point is, you know, we're, we're talking about, we're not just talking about general government spending. We're talking about government spending, you know, that otherwise would have gone to a bed net distribution or deworming or, you know, whatever we're doing. And so it seems reasonably likely that money earmarked for that kind of activity would other have been, otherwise have been spent on you know, quite good things. So I think it would be better than the average government spending. And, and that's one reason, you know, we've looked at, you know, social health and education programs rather than, for example, military spending. Okay. Yeah. That makes a lot more sense now. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm not, you know, I wouldn't want to defend this too strongly. I mean, it's, it's, not something I feel confident in and something I think we could do a lot more work on. And then, even, you know, but then even if we do do more work on it, are we really going to feel that much more confident? Yeah. It, it's pretty uncertain. Well, it seems like, yeah, honing this leverage and funding issue hasn't changed the ranking all that much. So, so maybe it's not something that deserves a, a ton more attention. Yeah. So I think that's the question we're always thinking, right? It's like we prioritize kind of decision relevant information over, over kind of mathematical elegance. 
And and so it seems unlikely to me that kind of us spending a ton more time on this is going to change things, you know, hugely. I think where it could change things quite a lot is, you know, when you're thinking about these policy interventions, you know, they're a relatively high proportion of, you know, the funding. So say, you know, say you're uh, say you're advocating for regulating certain pesticides, you're spending relatively little on the advocacy there, but it costs, you know, it's going to cost the government some money to you know, test particular pesticides in labs to like roll out this regulation to enforce it. And so they're like a relatively higher proportion of the spending is government spending. And so this would be a more important question. So it, it, it's, you know, one of those things where we end up in a difficult position where it's like, we think this is actually like kind of important, but we don't really see a path to just like getting a better sense of it. I think that the main takeaway is just the world is incredibly complicated and, and we do the best we can, but we should really be very, um, very modest in, 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 our, in our beliefs. Well, let's move on to the policy-oriented interventions that that you've been looking at. What, yeah, what kinds of policy change are, uh, are you guys investigating, and um, what are the what are the main challenges there? So, as, as I kind of mentioned earlier, there, there's kind of two broad buckets that we're starting with. So, one is this kind of advocacy and, and technical assistance um, to impose particular health regulations, or, which can only really be done by governments. Um, so, you know, we're thinking about tobacco control, lead paint regulation, uh, pesticide regulation. You know, we, we're going to be looking at kind of road traffic safety at some point. And this is something that government's uniquely well-placed to do. And then the other is this kind of evidence-based policy bucket, which is saying, you know, what can we do to improve the use of evidence in governments? And the question there is like, okay, can we look at case studies of when we think one of these organizations has gone into a government and changed a decision they made? And so that's the kind of approach we're taking there. So, so I'd say they're the like two broad buckets that we're looking at. And how do you actually figure out whether these uh, whether this advocacy, advocacy is likely to succeed? Yeah, it's a good question. So there's a bunch of different ways. So thinking about you know, I don't, I don't want to get too much into the specifics of grants that we're still thinking about, but maybe if I kind of talk in broad terms about like what kind of research this involves. So, you know, we, we might think, well, okay, here is this change that was made in government policy uh, in India, say, like a couple of years ago. And, and we'll ask the charity, like, okay, do you think that was a lot of, you know, your value was from like influencing this change? And then we kind of have to piece together. It's interesting. It's, it's a bit more like investigative journalism than maybe the traditional work we're doing. We're just trying to like piece together from different sources. Okay, what are like the other causal strands that could have played a role here? Like how important was this actor relative to other actors? And sometimes it's very difficult to like tease these apart. But at least some narratives we can kind of, they seem just a lot more plausible to us. And then we can test those narratives by talking to other people who are involved and kind of think, well, is there a consistent story here that like does seem to draw a plausible causal pathway between you know, the actions of this charity and, uh, and this you know, particular policy change uh, coming into effect? And then the other part of that, of course, is like, well, how good was this policy? And that's, that looks a lot more like our traditional work. Yeah, are there any particular policy changes that you'd like to dive into more and discuss the, discuss the evidence base for? Yeah, so I, you know, I think we we did touch on it a bit already, but the uh, kind of because we've already made the grant and it's it's something that I've spent relatively large amounts of time on. I, I think pesticide regulation would would probably be the best thing to focus on. Whereas the other things, we're, we're very much in the middle of our investigation. I wouldn't want to you know state things publicly before I've got a you know better degree of confidence over um, what I feel about those. Yeah. So, what were the main uncertainties you, you or the main doubts that you had about about that intervention? Yeah. So it's interesting. So one 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 difficult thing about these policy changes is you often don't. It's it's quite hard to run a randomized controlled trial on, say, a regulation which comes. Well, it's impossible to run a randomized controlled trial on a regulation which comes into effect in you know a country like all at once. Right? And there are you know there are some times that like regulations might be imposed. They might happen in a kind of sequential way, in which case you might be able to tease out a kind of well-identified quasi-experimental study there. But often often that's just not the case. And so for pesticide regulation, there, there appears to be some evidence that pesticide regulation reduced total suicides in Korea, Sri Lanka, Jordan, just to name a three, uh, three and, and a few other countries as well. And, and so we kind of talked about the potential mechanisms before, but one potential mechanism is that suicide attempts remain relatively stable, but because people are using pesticides of a lower case fatality, and they can vary a lot, that, that's less likely to result in death. And another potential mechanism is, is you make the means with a very low barrier, difficult to acquire, and that reduces spontaneous suicide. So I think there are like really serious issues with the direct uh, evidence base. So we don't have a well-identified study, and, and we're basically relying on time trends, which could very easily be right. confounded. For example, there was a civil war in Sri Lanka. So this is, this is before and after the policy change, basically. And then, then you hope that, that most of the shift there is because of the policy rather than something else. 
Yeah, so I think it's partly it's partly hope. Um, I think there are things you can do to, you know, you're never going to be as certain, I think, as if you have a well-identified experiment. But there are things you can do to just investigate different hypotheses. So, you know, as I said, there, there was a civil war in Sri Lanka around the time that suicide started to drop. But if you just look at the kind of when the when the civil war fighting intensified and, and, and when, when it started and when it finished, it doesn't just doesn't really line up with the dates that suicide started to drop. So it seems like reasonably unlikely that this would have had a big effect, although it's really hard to kind of rule out various things that happen within that. Does the civil war generally reduce suicide? <laughs> yeah, so that, we don't know, right? I mean... Right, yeah. Okay, but it's a big, it's a big change, so could have, done, could have had a lot of effects. Yeah, so I mean, so one plausible mechanism is... So, so people who commit suicide, particularly through pesticide, are often people who are you know, working in agricultural jobs. And if they're out you know, fighting in a war... You might expect that, you know, they're not sitting at home. And I don't know, that feels like a bit of a stretch, like maybe, right? I mean, you could also make the other argument that civil wars tend to make make people less happy and so you might increase suicide. Possibly it creates this like sense of group solidarity and gives people more reason to live because they feel like they're part of some broader mission of winning this war. Yep, that's definitely possible. That's definitely possible. And so, yeah, it's just really difficult, right, with these confounders. It's like you go in either direction. Like, it's kind of hard to know what to make of that. You know, you can also look at other things that you know are associated with suicide, say, like unemployment. What, what happened to unemployment in Sri Lanka? What happened to, like, economic growth? And there again, like, the dates just don't really line up. And so you can't rule these things out. And, of course, there might just be things you haven't even thought of, right? Like, that's the trouble with these studies. But I think something I did find reasonably compelling is um, what we do have is medical reports from hospitals in Sri Lanka, which look at like how many people came in for like pesticide poisoning and which pesticides were being used. And so there, what's cool is we can kind of see like, you know, what was the mechanism that was going on here? And there does seem to be some suggestion that less toxic pesticides became more common after the bans. And this kind of explains some of the reduction. And so those broadly, but, but not perfectly support the story that people are switching to less toxic options. So I think this is this is interesting because it's like it's a question about like how you do research, right? And I think like the right question here isn't what characteristics did this study have? You know, was it well identified? It's often like, well, what's the most plausible explanation given like the broad sweep of evidence? And when you kind of look at that broad sweep, it did seem likely to me that pesticide regulation had a you know fairly big impact on suicide. So this is a fairly unusual policy change. It's not something that I'd ever thought about before speaking with you. So how did you how did you find this one? And and do you do a lot of exploration to try to find these, you know, unusual interventions that other people haven't thought about yet? Yeah, so we this is actually a slightly odd one. So I think this maybe highlights the importance of you know, assuming, assuming this ended up being a good idea, which is um, you know, not at all obvious, but it highlights the importance of maybe like just reacting to things that you come across rather than uh, as well as having this kind of very systematic way of looking through things. So the story was, I, you know, when I, when I used to work at the Center for Effective Altruism, we were doing a uh, report on mental health. So a kind of cause specific report where we're like, okay, say mental health is the thing you care about. What would be a good organization to, to do there? And this involved looking through kind of various sources like disease control priorities too. And so I kind of came across this idea of pesticide regulation there. And at the time, I didn't prioritize it. And there are two reasons for that. So the actual quote in DCP2 doesn't make it look cost effective. And it also appeals to kind of different moral values from, you know, it's a different worldview that would lead you to think that this was important versus like mental health is important. It's almost the opposite worldview. And so that's not something I dug into deeper at the time. But then I posted, a while later, we posted the mental health report on the Effect of Altruism Forum. Uh, and a guy called Austin Forrester, who was pretty interested in this issue, he offered to introduce me to Michael Edelston, who was a professor who worked in Sri Lanka, you know, helping regulate these pesticides at the time. And so I had a conversation with him. And that conversation kind of made me look back at the cost effectiveness analysis in DCP2 and realized it was just using a very different methodology from how I would have done it. In particular, it was only looking at the impact over one year, which is going to make it look a lot less good than, you know, we, we would think looking from a longer term perspective, um, which is an interesting data point in itself, right? It's like, how much can you just trust the headline cost effectiveness results without understanding exactly how it's done? So that was, that was interesting because it was very much like, it, it was a bit of a fluke. Right, that this this kind of came up. It was just it, there happened to be this guy in the effective altruism community who was like who had thought about this. So when I moved to Give Well, I took that work with me, um, and we dug more into the research. And the more we dug it, it really did start to look like quite an exciting grant and quite an exciting opportunity. I mean, the other thing here, of course, there wasn't an organisation working on it, and so it's kind of a, a happy circumstance. Well, I, I guess it's not a purely circumstance because there was desire to create an organisation. From, from Michael Edelston, who's, who ended up, we ended up funding. But, but I do think there's a lesson here about like, well, first being responsive to opportunities when they kind of start to arise and recognizing the value when you see it. And also just the benefits of the effective action in the community and like lots of people thinking about this stuff. 
for identifying new interventions we might just might not have considered. So it seems like in the past, Givo has been a little bit reluctant to look into these kind of policy advocacy issues because there was a sense that the, the evidence base was never going to be really sufficient to meet Givo's standards. Um, why, why are you looking into it now? Is it just that the, the reward uh, to risk ratio is, uh, looks, looks different now? Yeah, so I actually, I'm, I'm not, I don't think I have a great sense of what Givo's attitude was to these things before. Maybe, maybe there's a few different things at play, and I, I can't say exactly, you know, which of these were the real reason. But I think all of these might like lead us to to think more about this. So one is that we think we have covered quite a lot of the space in our more traditional work, and and you know, there's there's always more to be done. Um, and you know, there are other interventions which look a lot more like our you know general top charities that we still haven't reviewed, um, as well as kind of other sectors that we think we're still at the pretty early stages of, so education and agriculture, uh, two in particular. So I think kind of one push was, you know, this funding constraint issue. Like you know, when, when we're pretty funding constrained, the value of finding something, if we have a 10% chance of finding something, you know, 20 times as good as, as cash, you know, we, we'd want to we'd wanna take that over a 100% chance of finding something four times as good as cash. Because, you know, at that point, we're just displacing funds from our marginal charities and we're not making a huge difference there. So I think those are two two reasons. So one is, you know, we, it might not be as relatively valuable to identify other similar charities. And this seems like an area that might be more, if we can feel confident in it, um, or even if we can't, but we kind of make our best guess, that this could be an area where like there's a potential to find things which are like better than our top charities. Yeah. And the other being that, that we think we've covered, you know, quite a lot of the space. Are there any other mental health um, interventions that you're looking at other than preventing uh, pesticide suicide? Yeah, so it's on my um, it's on my list of priorities this year uh, to go back and, and look again at mental health. It, it's I've done some work on it, but I think it's such a large area that I, I really haven't done the space justice. I can talk about kind of what my thoughts are so far, and I'll focus on depression because that's something that I've spent you know the most time on, partly because it's just the largest burden of disease. I think I think there are a few different ways that you can. You know, treat depression. So, so one that I've been mostly focused on is, is psychotherapy to treat depression. And my current best guess is that psychotherapy to treat depression generally isn't as cost effective as our top charities. Yeah, wouldn't it be quite wouldn't it be quite expensive to deliver? Because you've got to have someone there, you know, for many hours potentially treating someone. Yeah, so I think this is the problem, right? You, you've hit the nail on the head. So I think there are ways around this, but maybe not you know ways that make it perfectly scalable. So, so if I was to recommend an organisation you know, based on my like current feelings. It'd be an organization called Strong Minds that works in Uganda. And that's, that's a charity I'd recommend for someone who wanted to donate in that area. And they use a task shifting model where they use uh, mental health facilitators rather than psychiatrists uh, to deliver interpersonal therapy. And they also treat people in groups. Um, and those two things kind of bring the cost down. But it still costs, I mean, the last time I spoke to them, and this was over a year ago, it cost about $200 per person. Uh, and I expect that that's come down now as they've reached a greater scale. But you know, it still is a relatively intense. You know, even though it's 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 so much more, it's so much cheaper than than therapy in, in developed countries you know, delivered by psychiatrists. Um, and I think what they've done there is you know really great. It, it's still you know compared to other things, you know, a, a deworming pill costs fifty cents. And of course, you have to scale that against the against the scale of the benefit. But uh, it it is a relatively resource intense intervention. What about delivering antidepressant drugs? I've, I've heard that they can be extremely cheap once they're off patent. Yeah, it's a good question. So I actually, um, it's, this is something I feel like I haven't really got to the bottom of. So on antidepressants, my, it's a pretty controversial evidence base, but my, my read on the evidence is I, I just find it pretty compelling. I think one of the key skeptical claims is the possibility of publication bias, um, particularly with uh, pharmaceutical companies not you know, publishing their, their negative results. Or I think, although I think the evidence for that is pretty mixed, um, that like publication bias is, is a strong thing there. And I think there was a new meta-analysis that came out. I haven't looked at it yet, but it looked at unpublished data from pharmaceutical companies. And it claims, I mean, I, I haven't vetted this in depth, but it at least claims not to have found you know, strong evidence of a lot of publication bias. So say we think that antidepressants are like effective. It, it's interesting to me that it was like not a lot of charities I could find when I did my kind of initial search with like using this strategy. And my, my guess is that it's something that generally needs to be integrated into the healthcare system because it needs yeah. to be prescribed for a doctor. And so these would be delivered through clinics. And this would have two effects. So rather than like one is it would actually you know, increase the cost because you need to have a doctor rather than a community health worker, um, although it might still be cost effective. And the other is that it kind of makes it a, you know, maybe quite a poor fit for a vertical program, which would be delivered by a charity. But these are kind of just kind of my initial guesses. And it's something I want to look into more because it, it certainly seems strange to me that this isn't something which is more widely, widely used. 
Okay, well, let's talk now about what it's just like working at GiveWell. I guess the conversation so far has given people a reasonably good sense of you know, what kind of questions uh, the researchers uh, at GiveWell are, are looking into. But um, how did you end up working there? Like, what, what's what's been your career progression so far, and why did you why did you choose to move to GiveWell? Let's see. So maybe if I, I start from the beginning and give you the kind of, you know, since, since I left college and give you the kind of very quick overview. So I, I left, uh, I finished a degree at Oxford in philosophy, politics and economics um, in 2011 and then didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. And so like anyone who didn't know what they wanted to do with their life, I became a, a consultant. Classic. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I think, how are you, how are you feeling about that on 80,000 hours at the moment? I don't know where you landed on it. Yeah, uh, well, it's been something that we've recommended for people who didn't know at all what they wanted to do in the past. But I think we now think it may be one of the biggest misunderstandings that people have taken away from our advice is uh, there's just a lot of people going into consulting and they're basically gaining skills that aren't directly relevant to what they're going to do later. So, so I think we're actually going to do an episode where we talk about misconceptions about our advice, uh, and 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 this this one will come up that we think maybe more people are going into consulting that maybe, maybe than really should. But that, that's a that's another conversation. Yeah, that'd be a great episode. Yeah, so I, I, I guess maybe this is a good stage for me just to like reflect on that a little bit. And it, it's really difficult to uh, like know whether you did the right thing in the future because you never observe the counterfactual. And I, I think there's definitely I don't know how much I'm fooling myself here, but I, I think there are definitely skills that I picked up in consulting, which have been pretty useful for give well work. And now I don't know, I don't know how that would compare to, you know, doing a PhD, an economics PhD in the same amount of time. Um, I, I suspect it would have been better to do the economics PhD. But at the same time, you know, this isn't something that I knew that I wanted to do. And so that was kind of option value there. So I, I do think kind of uh, in terms of prioritizing work fast and making decision, thinking about things in a decision relevant way, rather than necessarily in like a, maybe a more academic way, that's a pretty good place to learn those skills in consulting and just being like really competent with or you know hopefully quite competent with uh, excel and just being able to like model things quickly and not being afraid to do back of the envelopes that was something that was that was quite useful as well and i think there were a lot of problems as well the, the kind of consulting doesn't always have the epistemic culture that like really teaches you to do good research i guess and that's something i've had to you know unlearn quite quickly as i as i've you know started to do jobs which <laughs> it's it's kind of we're, we're trying to get the right answer well, where the right answer matters more than a compelling answer. Well, exactly, yeah. Uh, and so I think, you know, I wouldn't want to overblow how, you know, we weren't just like lying, but there were, it, it wasn't perfect in that regard, I'd say, consulting. So yeah, anyway, they're my, they're my quick thoughts about like whether that would be a good thing to do. So I did that for three years and then uh, decided that that, you do a wide range of things in consulting. So it did let me rule out a lot of things quite quickly. And at that point was thinking, okay, well, my initial plan was go and learn these skills in consulting and then go out and do something good in the world. And, and by the way, I kind of skipped over a chapter, which is I joined Giving What We Can in 2011. So this is right at the end of my degree as a member. But at the time, this, I think this was before effective altruism became a thing. And I also wasn't kind of a deeply engaged member of the community. I just, um, a friend told me about this website. I kind of looked at it and was like, yeah, yeah, they're totally right. So kind of signed up for it that way without kind of becoming deeply embedded in the community. But it was something that was already happening. Um, and I think I'm quite, I'm quite rare in that. I think a lot of people who got into effective altruism kind of, you know, very much got into the community first. So I did that for three years, uh, then went away and did a, a master's in philosophy and economics because I still couldn't decide which of those subjects was better. And during that time, started getting really interested in the kind of philosophy of effective altruism and kind of that way of like thinking about the world and kind of thinking like, what is the best thing you can do? And then on leaving, on, on, on finishing my master's, which is a one-year master's, I ended up at, um, I saw Giving What We Can was applying for a job. And of course, this is like an organization I'm a member of. It's an organization I'd like, I think their mission is incredible. I think it's like the thing that I want to work on. And so, so joined them initially at Giving What We Can. And then when Giving What We Can kind of got absorbed into the Center for Effective Altruism, uh, kind of moving across there, doing, doing relatively similar kinds of work. So I, I worked as a researcher and given what we can also spend a bit of time on outreach. Um, but I think it was, uh, the research was what I really wanted to do. And I think it was the thing that I was, I was better at as well. So then I ended up moving to give well after, uh, so it, it turned out, and I, I think this is something that we've been thinking about for a while, which was that we didn't feel at CEA that we were adding, um, our research was adding a lot of value over what give well was doing. And so it just kind of made sense that I could, so, so one thing that happens, you know, I was, I was investigating this grant and then we, I'd, I'd come to an answer and a recommendation, but there wasn't really a good way to like raise funds for that. It was, we, we didn't have that structure in place, uh, given what we can. It's like, you know, we, we think we've found this great organization. What do we do now? You can recommend it to the members, but they won't necessarily follow the recommendation. Exactly. I think if, by, by this point, GiveWell's, well, I think, I think this is partly 
just like fair and partly reputation. So Goodwell's reputation and also I think it's just ability to do research was, was I think at a, a much more developed stage than than giving what we can or, or or center for effective altruism. So it was two things. It was like having like having trouble like raising funds for a thing and also just having this kind of meta uncertainty and, and, and often thinking, well like, you know what I'd really like? I'd like Ellie to spend like a load of time like vetting my work. And so that it just kind of made sense to make that shift. And because and CEA were, you know, we we were shutting down our research arm because we'd kind of come to this realization. But I think it was a really like, you know, I only spent a year at, at CEA and, and because it was such a similar job to what I'm doing at Gibwell, and it was also kind of very self-directed because th- there weren't many of us. It was it was me and Halka Hillebrandt and, and uh, Marinella Capriati. And, and so there was a lot of like, okay, we were working this out as we went along, which I think can be a really good learning experience. So I ended up at, at Gibwell and, and I guess the rest is very recent history. So if someone was listening and they were considering working at GiveWell, um, what are the most satisfying things about working at GiveWell? And I guess, what, what are some things that you wish you could change if you could? Yeah, so I think, I think personally, what I found like very satisfying, just from a purely, you know, what makes me feel good perspective, the feeling of making a grant, which you know wouldn't otherwise have been made, and then following that is just one of the most satisfying experiences I've ever had because it really feels like there's a concrete way in which you've made a difference. And you probably have made a, you know, possibly a very large positive difference in the world, assuming it was a good grant. And so I personally, I, I found that more emotionally fulfilling than when I've done various direct volunteering work. Um, although I, I may, you know, that might be more of a reflection on my personality than, than a kind of general truth. So I think that's, I guess that's true of like a lot of funders, right? I mean, that's something that you can experience there i mean i think the thing that really struck me working at GiveWell is you are working with like incredibly smart and incredibly curious and incredibly kind people so that's something i've like really enjoyed so you had that at giving what we can as well but i, I think at give well it, that there's a kind of unique epistemic culture there where it really does feel like everybody's trying to get the right answer and nobody's trying to convince other people of things necessarily they're trying to find out the right answer in a kind of cooperative way so that's something I really enjoyed. And, and people are kind of really honest and open with each other. Um, so one thing is, if, if you're thinking about working at Goodwell, it is kind of really important that you're able to take critical feedback well. And, you know, people are quite good at delivering this feedback. You know, it, it's, you know, people aren't generally just like, you know, you're terrible, you suck. Um, it's like pretty constructive. But I think, you know, some people are better than others, at, you know, taking that well. And, and that's a good trait to have if you want to be at, at Goodwell. And then in terms of like things I would change... So I think some of this is like there are good reasons for these things. But say, okay, from a personal development perspective, I think like compared to most other funders, um, we make relatively few grants. So I think, you know, that might not be optimal from trying to learn like how to do this well and getting like quick feedback loops. Um, So because we're directing large amounts of money to relatively few charities, we spend a lot of time for grantee, which which is good in a way because it really lets you get to the bottom of things. But I think you can probably, my, my guess is you can develop your intuitive grasp for complex problems quicker um, if you spend less time on each grant and then just get stronger feedback by making like lots of smaller grants. And that's not GiveWell's model. So I think that's something that, you know, I, I, I don't think this is something that like GiveWell should change because it's a core part of, you know, our, our model. But it is something that like you might want to think about if you're, you know, optimizing for like really learning a lot about the field of philanthropy in a very short amount of time. Yeah, what's what's the management style like at GiveWell? Uh, uh, is each staff member kind of free to set their own agenda, or do you kind of have to fit into a you know very specific project that uh, you know is an important part of the, of the of the broader research agenda for that year? Yeah, so we I wouldn't say we're free to set our own agenda. So for this year, we planned out. We went through quite a long process where we worked out what our research priorities were. We've got this like pretty amazing spreadsheet which Ellie put together, which like tries to tries to estimate the ROI of like every kind of research we could do. And obviously, this is you know highly highly subjective, but it's you know at least a way of thinking about the problem. So I think you know once that research agenda is set, um, you know if, if there are particularly high priority things that kind of come up, then yes, you could do that, but you'd have to make the case to like get it on that list because um, we think it's really important to be like focused and, and really make sure that our, we're doing the highest priority things first. Um, I think where you know you do have a lot of freedom is like. At the point where that list is being put together or afterwards, you know, if you make a strong argument for like, okay, this is what I think is the most valuable use of my time or like, you know, this is something I'm really excited about. I want to spend like a bit of time looking into it. That That's generally going to be listened to. Although I think it's often, you know, it's not like if someone's like, oh, I want to spend the next three weeks like looking at this like crazy thing. So I mean, I, I got quite um, obsessed with Snakebite relatively recently and started, you know, I was just like looking into that. But it was very much like, a, okay, 
let's see what the five hour version looks like. Let's see what the 10 hour version looks like. And then let's think like, you know, is this worth prioritizing? You're not free to set your own agenda, but you have an input into what the overall agenda is. How much time do you spend kind of talking to charities or or traveling to to meet charities that, that you might recommend? Yeah, so we don't spend that much time traveling to meet charities. Um, so personally, I'd like to do more field visits um, because I think they are really, well, partially because I think they're really valuable for personal development and partially because I think there might be a lot of unmeasured benefits we're getting from them in terms of just getting a more intuitive understanding of how the implementation of a lot of these programs work. Um, so we generally, we've done field visits for uh, most of our top charities, but not all of them. Um, and that's something that, you know, we, we, I think we've probably spent, I, not having a great understanding of exactly how other funders work, but my sense is that we spend less time on that than, than most, other, uh, most other funders. In terms of like talking to people, yeah, so I, th- I think that's really important. So um, as you know, we, we publish all our conversation notes from, from conversations we have. And, you know, in a typical week, I might have three or four conversations with like external experts on like a variety of topics. And so we think that's really important because uh, particularly when you know, we're an organization with quite a large focus area, like it's quite a broad scope of stuff we do relative to a lot of a lot of funders. And so and, and because we go into things in like quite a lot of depth, most of our researchers are generalists. And so it's quite important to just be like, OK, well, we can talk to the foremost expert on drug resistance, you know, to uh, to anti-malarial drugs. And, and that's just I, I personally like generally find those conversations incredibly valuable. What's the office culture like within GiveWell? Does, does it still feel like a startup or is it a, a fairly mature organization now? Yeah, so I'd say it's somewhere in between. So I think there's a sense in which I'm uniquely badly placed to comment on like the physical office culture in, uh, at GiveWell because I, I work remotely from London. But I, I have spent uh, about three months in our office in, in San Francisco. So I think that the impression that most people get is it, it's pretty serious uh, and like pretty quiet. Yeah, that, that, that's my impression visiting. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So I know you spent a bit of time there, Robin. It's just this kind of deafening silence which greets you as you. <laughs> p- p- people are very focused on 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 the spreadsheets on their screen. As was my was my impression. Yeah, I think that's right. So okay, so I think we're. I mean, this is an obvious point, but we're, we're doing a serious job. So I think it's right that we take it seriously, and and we also attract quite a lot of like quite a lot of nerdy people, which which makes sense given the work we do. I do think maybe this is like overplayed a bit in terms of like the general perception. I remember when I first started, I, I was a bit worried about it. So I remember going on a walk with Ellie and mentioning that I worried I like maybe wasn't that good a fit because like everyone's so serious and like quiet. And and actually like now I'm not worried about that at all. And I think that was like something of a false impression. So I, I think a few things. So one is that we actually have like a pretty vibrant Slack culture. Um, so that's like the instant messenger we use and it's our main method of communication. So I don't know. I don't know if that's a very good defense, but like we're hilarious on Slack, Rob. Um, <laughs> so, so it's not like people aren't communicating, um, but we are generally like we've prioritized being respectful of other people's focus. I don't know. Maybe like two other things I'd point to. Uh, so because we um, we write in such like a formal way on our website, it was inter- what, something that surprised me was like how much less formal internal communication was. And like actually much less formal than say when I was in a consulting job. And so kind of the argument there is like it takes so much time to kind of edit your uh, language and stuff when you're sending emails or like writing internal reports. And I think there's a lot of time wasted in, you know, a lot of jobs where like you're not really trying to make yourself clearer. You're trying to make yourself like sound more impressive. And it's very, very obvious when you read that kind of writing. Or, or, or I guess do the right social grooming, you know, be polite to the right people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I, I, don't, I don't think there's much of that at GiveWell. And I think that's pretty valuable. You know, seriousness isn't the same as formality. And like, you know, often something written informally can actually be a lot clearer than something written for me. Maybe another data point is in my experience, like, so I went through uh, like a minor depressive episode at like when I was working at GiveWell and like my managers were just really excellent there, like better than anywhere else I've been. So I think like people can be emotionally intelligent without being extroverted, like obviously. So I don't know, that's something, and I, I don't know, that's just me who's like found that. And that's just with like my managers. But I wouldn't be surprised if that was like a broad rule about people at GiveWell. Maybe let's talk about the, the jobs that are available at, at GiveWell at the moment, if someone's been enjoying the conversation so far and it sounds like the kind of uh, office that they'd like to work in. Um, do, do, you know, do you know what roles are available right now? Yeah, so we're hiring for a number of positions and we'd encourage people with the right skill sets to apply for them. So they're all advertised on our website and maybe if you could put up a link in the description there, Rob, um, like on our jobs page. If what you want is a part-time position, um, you know we're always looking for new conversation note writers. So these are the you know, these are the people who do like really invaluable work, like listening to the recordings of all our conversations and then writing them up and publishing them. And so that's like a part-time role, but you know in the in the past that has led to people you know we'll start as a conversation note writer and then, then become a research analyst. 
Uh, so what's kind of the natural path to, to getting a job at GiveWell? You know, what kind of undergraduate degrees can people study or perhaps postgraduate degrees or other places they can work to, to make sure that they're, uh, that, they, that they're getting the skills they need to, to thrive at GiveWell and, and actually get a job there? Yeah, so we, we actually have quite a variety of career paths that have ended up at GiveWell. So I think some, some things that like do stand out is uh, it, it's good to have a quantitative background, like whether that's in academia or in a career as a researcher or maybe doing some kind of consulting, which is more focused on analysis. So I'd recommend you know, going and doing a subject like economics um, or statistics at university is like a pretty good preparation for the kind of work we do at GiveWell. Um, I'd also like mention that we're not, you know, if what you're really interested in is going like very deep, on the academic research. We do have some people who do that. So like David Rubin is one, but generally the skill set of our research is more generalist and it's not necessarily, you know, you don't need to be an expert statistician to like work at GiveWell. So I, I think kind of in terms of the character traits we're looking for, like we're just ideally we're looking for people who are just really interested in the question of how to do the most good with your giving, right? I mean, this is like a really interesting question. And if you're not interested in it, that's this, like this just wouldn't be the place for you quite obviously and often that means that someone who's already like somewhat familiar with our work which is why you know i I expect a lot of people who are involved in effective altruism might might be a good fit at give well because often you know we find a lot of our like most engaged donors are from from the ea community uh so to wrap up do you want to give people i guess a a call to arms to to actually apply for these jobs at at give well and and not just uh, shut off the podcast and not think about this again uh, yeah, so I'd really encourage people to work at GiveWell. Um, I've been there a year and it's the best job I've ever had. Um, I think there are three like really important reasons that you know what somebody would want to work at GiveWell. Uh, so the first is just a combination of working with smart, like interesting people um, who really do care about the world. Second is just working on some of the you know, most fascinating questions I've come across and really like thinking for a problem and trying to work out what's true. And the third is just like, I think there's a really high potential for impact uh, by working at GiveWell. Fantastic. Uh, Thanks so much. Uh, My guest today has been James Snowden. Thanks for coming on the 80,000 Hours Podcast, James. Cool. Thanks, Rob. The 80,000 Hours Podcast is produced by Kieran Harris. Thanks for joining. Talk to you next week.